Okay, hey guys, and welcome to week 72 of the UnderwaterRealm.com video blog. You remember last week that I was talking to you about the underwater illusions that we employ to give the impression that we're in a much larger body of water than the small pool that we're inevitably shooting in. Well, we're getting hundreds of questions in about the underwater workflows that we use in order to actually be able to make these films and overcome all the problems that are inherent in making a movie underwater. So what better time to start talking about it than when we've completed 1208 and 1588 and are moving on to the biggest challenge of principal photography as we started to shoot 149 BC. So this is the last of the five films and this is always going to be the biggest challenge in the project. In fact, in many ways, the biggest challenge of our filmmaking careers. Because not only did this film have a lot of action, but it also had a really important dramatic heart and it had six actors that all needed to be working together, acting underwater simultaneously, which was an enormous challenge. So we're going to be talking about the, the technical and creative ways in which we try to overcome all of these problems one at a time in order to try and make some movie magic underwater. Now the first thing, as is the heart of every great film set, it's good communication. It's the heart of every great workplace really. And underwater it's almost impossible. Anybody that knows anything about diving will have seen the traditional methods of, of hand signals or, uh, or even small plastic slates that you write on with a piece of paper to try and get your point across. But of course none of this was going to do any good underwater. Some of you might even know about the, the wireless communications that use transducers that allow you to sit there on the surface with a, like a handheld CB microphone that will then broadcast to a load of small earpieces underwater that the divers can wear. But of course this is no good at all for the actors who of course can't integrate that into their costume. So we ended up developing a system of a very large underwater speakers, uh, the same sort of thing that uh, an underwater synchronized swim team would use, but on a much larger scale, along with a system of, of amplifiers and mixing desks on the surface, and then modified a whole load of lav mics, fairly rudimentary um, Sennheiser lav microphones that we turned into push-to-talk, splash-proof walkie-talkies, effectively. And that allowed myself, Eve, and a bunch of other members of the crew up on the surface to be able to wander around the side of the pool and actually click and talk to the divers in crystal clear audio. It also allowed us to play music through the water so that our divers and more importantly our actors could really relax as they're underwater and just take their mind off the sometimes quite oppressive environment being underwater. And they could listen to music, good chill out music that would lower the heart rate, relax the mind and allow their breath holding to last much, much longer. Now, the breath holding was another one of the large problems that we had to overcome. Of course, underwater, nine times out of ten, you're not going to be able to breathe terribly easily unless you're a particularly skilled freediver. But uh, we, we needed to get our actors underwater for extended periods of time. Now, with, with just two actors, that's not too difficult because they can kind of keep eye contact with each other and three, two, one, breathe up and drop down into the water. But when you've got six people all doing this at the same time, often from vastly different positions in the pool, by the time, if you, if you get it wrong, by the time the last person is down and settled and has got their place in the water, it's time for the first one to come up again. So it was a really big challenge. And one of the key instrumental factors in this, as well as, as creating the, the underwater kind of music environment, was to cast two very highly skilled freedivers in amongst that cast of, of, of six. And they came in the form of a guy called Sam Still, who just phenomenal freediver currently holds the British record at 8 minutes and 19 seconds of breath holding underwater which is just phenomenal and also the wonderful Dan Verhoeven who is a professional freediver and photographer and between the two of them they were asked to, to kind of shepherd the rest of the actors and, and create a really nice relaxing environment on the surface and talk them through some really basic visualizations and meditations to just lower the heart rate so that when they slipped into the water we had the maximum time possible and I have to say with, with those guys on board and with the environment that we hopefully created to, to help back up that relaxation we never really had to do a second take because of a failed breath hold it just stopped being a problem communication as I said with the underwater comms went up just enormously efficient but what we also needed was a form of visual communication a two-way visual communication as well as the camera that we had underwater, the, the Red Epic in its gates housing, which was piping a signal to the surface that allowed us to see into the water, we also had effectively what's a, an underwater CCTV rigged up so that we could see the scene writ large. So even if we're in there on a close-up on two of the actors, we can still see all of the safety divers and we can see everything that's going on around them. We also needed a way to visually communicate with the team that are underwater. So 
what we used was uh, laser pens. Now this seems obvious when you think about it, but actually it made a really, really important shift in the way that we were working, specifically with lighting and moving elements of the set around. It meant that myself or Eve or Brian, who was functioning as our, our surface supervisor in the dive capacity, or more like an underwater assistant director, he could actually take a laser pen and, and call a diver over, point to a light and say, I want you to move this light over here and I want you to point it in this direction. And, and with that level of two-way communication from the surface to underwater, it meant that we could function almost as efficiently as a, a traditional dry film set on land. Really, really great workflow. The camera department made a number of innovations too, as well as having the, the CCTV so they could see the whole scene working. They also had a live video feed from the camera, which was absolutely crucial, but we had to make some quite tough decisions. There's a couple of schools of thought and the debate's been ongoing about whether your director of photography should be underwater or above water. And we've tried both, but to me, it just seems madness to take the person who's responsible for the visual, the look of the films, and, and put them underwater where they can't communicate with anybody. So we had Eve very much up on the surface with a live video feed of everything that was being captured underwater where she could vocally communicate with the camera operator underwater, Rich Stevenson, but also the rest of the lighting team. So she could actually coordinate all of the visuals of the film underwater at the same time. Rich Stevenson uh, then became the, the camera operator, very, very skilled camera operator, and it requires an incredibly fine control of buoyancy, which Rich has built up over a, a career in diving spanning decades. He'll kill me for saying that. But he is absolutely spot on, almost like a Jedi with his buoyancy. And we demanded in this piece, through the, uh, the use of Eve's pre-visualization that she'd created for the film, a very high level of dynamic camera moves. And this was really, really important, but what we couldn't expect Rich to do at the same time was control his buoyancy, swim around with the camera, keeping it steady, framing the actors just so to match the previs, and be twisting a dial on the side of the camera to control the focus. It was just too much task loading and something was gonna give way. And we couldn't afford to take the risk of doing three takes to get the focus right when we could have got it in one take. So we spoke to the manufacturers of the camera housing gates to see if we could do anything to, to take that, that control of the focus and pipe it up to the surface. But nothing had been developed. It was deemed uh, not right for the audience or too technically difficult. But we were determined it, it had to happen to make this film work. And so we got in touch with a good friend, a guy called Pete Hoare. Um, Pete is responsible for the Hocus Focus system that came out a few years back and is now developing a really, really powerful system called the Axis Controller, which is a really strong little motor that creates a wireless follow focus that can control focus, iris, zoom. And we got together with Pete, and with a little bit of jiggery pokery and a little bit of modification of his kit, we actually managed to fit the motor and the control unit for the motor inside the underwater gates housing. But it was a wireless communication, and as anybody that's tried to do anything like this in the past will know, wireless doesn't really work through the water. So what we needed to do then was install a second cable port, the same as the cable that's carrying the signal from the camera to the surface for the video feed. We installed a second cable, same cable, HDSDI with a BNC connector on the end, and we turned that into an incredibly long antenna. So it popped out of the water and was then clipped to, uh, to the side of the pool with a small Wi-Fi antenna. And that meant that Rich Maskey on the surface could sit next to E with a live full HD video feed and a wireless focus control and actually nailed the focus every time. And to that end, it was very, very rare that we had to do a second take because of an, a photo shot that became out of focus. And that was crucial because across shooting this, we had four days with all of our actors. And in those four days, we had to capture everything. It was a four minute scene. Now, technologically, we had to build up a, a really interesting surface workflow as well. We had a full computer system set up on poolside, along with all of this, this video kit coming out of the water. And when we went in on the first day, we had the entire film set out as a full animated previs, which was really great because it meant we could see exactly where we were. But what we ended up doing over the week was actually replacing shot by shot by shot as we were gradually working our way through the scene, making sure that it cut in with the previs so that we knew it was gonna work when we got the next shot and the next shot and the next shot. And that was a great workflow, but it wouldn't have been possible without the software at the heart of that workflow, which was the Adobe Creative Suite, Adobe CS6, which allowed us to, as soon as the camera was out of the water and the case had been cracked open, the SSD went straight into the computer, the footage went straight onto a very fast hard drive and could be edited without any conversion there at all. So it was all working in real time. Another time this became really, really important was when we realized that we needed to create the illusion that not only was the water much, much 
larger than and than was actually true. We need to make the water feel much deeper. And of course, there aren't really very many ways that you can make the water feel deeper than four meters when it is only four meters deep. And this film called for us to have an actor with a rope tied around his feet and a rock pulling him down through 30 meters of water. And we had absolutely no idea how we were going to achieve this. But in the end, we managed to hang a green screen across one of the walls in the pool in place of one of our matte paintings. And with a system of pulleys and ropes, we actually managed to pull the actor horizontally through the water. Now this, of course, doesn't just work with pulling. We could have actors swim horizontally along with the camera rotated 90 degrees, or in fact, sometimes still shooting across the, the full 2K scope, depending on the shot. And the, the, we could then simulate by rotating the, the footage in post. And that, that is the real secret to the underwater illusion. It's not just having the, the light fall off so you can't see the pool in the background. It's about having those wide shots where you really establish how big your environment is. So there you have it. You have the camera department and some of the fantastic leaps and bounds that were made forward there. We have the, the underwater communications, the breath holding, just all of those things working together in perfect harmony, created just by the skin of our teeth, allowed us to, to complete that film and uh, it's looking really rather special. We're moving on into post-production on it now and we hope to get it all out to you. But for next week, you're gonna be tuning in and checking out what happened when we then went to Hawaii two days later to capture the first of the five pieces. We'll see you then at theunderwaterrealm.com.